Sandra Silberstein, otherwise known as Sandy, um, I was um, um, not only a TA but an RA for a, a long time while we were writing Reader's Choice. Mm -hmm. I'm Mark Clark, and uh, I was a, a TA the whole time I was at. Uh, well, I came in 1973. When did you come? I came in 1970, but I got the TA ship in 1971. Ah, so you. You were a veteran at the LI when I arrived, and you were an interloper. We had these tiny, tiny cubicles, and suddenly they put this guy in the chair that faced in back of mine, and Mark had a crew cut, it's true, which right? was not done in those days. And, <laughs> um, that meant you were really conservative and had nothing in common. Interesting. Yeah, I got there. We came from Saudi Arabia my wife and three children and I. And <clears throat> I had been at the ELI at, in Egypt before that. So I was uh, like a disciple coming to the source. I was coming to Michigan to be at Michigan, teach the Michigan way. And specifically I came to work with Mary Lawrence and discovered on the day I arrived that she had left. No email in those days. Um, so uh, I wandered in uh, and the cubicles I think were central to it was a, a central place. It was it was cheek to jowl. In fact, we shared uh, we shared desk. We didn't each have a desk, but they were uh, narrow and lined, and um, you couldn't. There was no conversation that was held in the cubicle that was not overheard by everybody. So um, there was a strong sense of community as yeah. a result. We learned either a lot that or you didn't people. show up. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. you didn't hang out in the cubicle. You, uh, well, but people. That's where you had to meet your students. So um, people held each other, heard each other mentoring mm -hmm. the students. Um, yeah. Everything got done there. Yeah. And it was uh, the, the the cubicles. The ELI was a an an, an incubator, a, a a totally uh, supercharged environment of professionalism. Everybody was talking linguistics, language acquisition, students grades, uh, it was uh, a heated environment, overheated environment of professional development. And it was a quintessential um, example of how architecture affects um, what happens, affects ideas, development, people, because if you'd looked at them, um, you would be embittered if someone told you that that was your workspace. I mean, the, the desks were about this big and they were shared and then the, um, you couldn't both um, leave your desk at the same time. So we're talking about four people in an awfully small area. But um, in fact, because of the camaraderie and because of the sort of intellectual energy, just extraordinary intellectual energy, um, it worked. Yeah, yeah. And so I think uh, the whole uh, era was one of great innovation and, and sense of agency and so forth. We were all uh, coming from different places. Some of us had been teaching elsewhere and so forth. Um, so it, we arrived as independent people with uh, ideas, but the, uh, we were coming to Michigan. And uh, the LI was a, uh, had a great sense of place and a sense of history. And, and um, and so the, there were the cubicles then right across from them. Well, there was th um, there were offices where Joan and Mary Lawrence and others hmm. they they had bigger <laughs> spaces, and then there was a, a lounge like area that yeah. we, we hung out in, and that uh, very often spilled over into that. And then down and the meetings hall, were held there, I think. Well, there were. Uh, I don't remember specific meetings, but there were definitely gatherings. We were gathered all the mm -hmm. time in there, and then. There was a place where we had uh, bag lunches just down the hall, and there were bag lunches uh, two or three times a week, maybe more often, with all of the big names in the profession coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were just we took it for granted you'd eat your uh, bag lunch and listen to the one of the current leaders in the field. Right. Well, there was Dulé and Bert, uh, uh, Earl Stevick, um, uh, Christina Bratt, Paulston. Uh, um, Betty Wallace Robinette. Betty Wallace Robinette. David Harris. Yeah. So, um, going back to the physical space. Physical space. 
It was bad enough that we had these cubicles, but the lounge <coughs> didn't even have a window. And I found this so annoying that I finally went and got a picture frame and arranged it as a window and put behind it um, a poster of a window with a man lurking and <laughs> hung it up on the wall and didn't tell anyone who had done this. You know, people just came in one day and they had a window. So, um, so there was a certain sense of um, community and irony. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The, the TAs were a, were a cohort. I mean, we were a force to be reckoned with because we outnumbered everybody else. Although I think there was uh, due deference to the professors and so forth. However, <coughs> when we uh, got together in this materials development seminar, uh, we had a certain independence from the uh, professors that uh, meant that we were often, there were often professors in search of their students because we were busy doing doing the material development. I mean, what, what happened, in fact, was um, I think more people registered than anticipated. So they, um, they hired a second professor, um, and, and there were two groups, the high group and the low group. And, um, uh, and, and as I said yesterday, you know, Mark kept saying, when are we going to write the book? And I thought, oh, it's not too bad after all. <laughs> yeah, when are we going to write that book? And um, I, I think that was taken as being so inappropriate and naive and annoying. You know, I mean, this is a little seminar, but you folks aren't ready for a book. And um, one day we were told that um, we, our room would be available that day. We'd have to go to this other room. And um, I think probably inadvertently a lot of people showed up at the original room. And we realized that, as in the cubicles, the conversations were so productive that, in fact, um, if we simply met without faculty, we'd actually get some stuff done. And, um, and I, I, I can't say it felt entirely good. I mean, it felt somewhat unkind because it was a very kindly professor. But, you know, whenever the professor would tell us to go to the other room, we go to the reverse. And um, we simply never showed up in the assigned room, and we just kept working um, and, until we had actually a, a, a prototypical chapter and um, a book proposal. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if it's worth talking about why we never used that chapter. I think it is. I mean, it, it speaks to a whole bunch of things that were going on. Perhaps before we get to that point, it's important to <laughs> mention that we took a long time developing that first unit because this, we understood the process to be one in which you produced uh, an example of what you were going to do and th that you would demonstrate the reasons why the publisher should uh, take the book. Mm -hmm. And so we worked very hard on this uh, and uh, spent a lot of time with the exercise and so forth. And, and shopped it around, got feedback and so forth from, from people. Um, and everybody agreed that technically it was a, a great example of um, materials, reading materials. But as Andy said, uh, we decided not to use it in the final um, copy. Um, we were told that we'd never get money to, um, to reproduce anything. So we had to find, as a reading selection, um, <coughs> something that was free. And um, of course, you know, Mark had lots of Aramco worlds having been, you know, in Saudi Arabia. And so we, um, we did a, um, a unit on um, earthquake and, um, <clears throat> and worked on it for a year. And, we're, and um, you know, we'll talk about in a second, you know, sort of what we did. But one day, Barb Dobson, um, <clears throat> who to this day asks the most trenchant questions, you know, I mean, the ones that seem so obvious you wouldn't ask them except that they're central, um, said, um, does anybody else find this depressing? And Mark said, oh my God, um, because, I mean, for some reason we thought that reading about tragedies close to home would make this, you know, appealing. And we had, you know, semantic groups of words like, devastate, demolish, destroy. <laughs> I mean, it was just really awful. And <laughs> we did it for a year. Um, gruesome, very gruesome. 
Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. So it was it didn't make it in, it didn't make the cut, but uh, but we did develop the uh, the exercises became very good. <laughs> and I did write a paper called Outtakes from Reader's Choice, yeah. and it made the cut for that. Right, right. and it became an important part of our uh, repertoire. I mean, we we took the show on the road after a while, mm -hmm. and uh, because it seemed like everybody uh, could benefit from what we'd learned about materials development. And um, that, that piece about taking into account who your students are and what their responses are going to be became uh, an important, well, it always, I think it always was. It was that we just hadn't, hadn't uh, focused on that aspect of it. And to t Sandy's point, it turns out that we were able to get permissions and we stopped worrying about uh, that, although Kelly still reprimands us if we get too expensive, too many colors or... No, as many colors as we want nowadays, because it doesn't ah, true. cost much. But um, um, so, and and, and those um, what what's unique to, to one thing that's unique to Reader's Choice is we have these skills units, quote unquote, and then the reading units. So because there are these moments as a teacher when you just want to pull out this thing you're trying to teach, and look at it and focus and practice. Um, you know, um, guessing vocabulary from context, or um, um, there are these things called stems and affixes. And so the fact that we go back and forth and that we actually do map them on, so they're not really in isolation, um, was what um, characterized the book in many ways. And that we, we had figured out. And it was, I think, very much influenced by, for me, it was two things. One was Mark had brought this book, Breaking the Reading Barrier. Um, from Saudi, you do, you're I, we Saudi. used it as a text, yeah. and um, <clears throat> you know, and um, and that was for native speakers, but it was very, very helpful. And there were pieces from other books, like David Harris's books and Esky. Um, but then there was um, Betsy Soden, who was a, um, a lecturer as well, and she had this interest in reading, and she you know, occasionally uh, develop skimming questions for kind of wretched textbooks that we were using, but you could develop apparatus that made them work. And um, so um, for me, it was, it was Betsy who got us thinking about um, how you could start mapping very different kinds of things onto texts. And then our sense of a kind of quirkiness of the universe made us choose um, readings that were, you know, I think a lot more appealing than the standard fare that we were finding. Um, and we were also bringing into the book things from the classrooms. I, I'd always done menus um, because I thought students have to eat. And, um, and you can't edit a menu. That is to say, that is what you will find in the restaurant, and you need a strategy, whatever proficiency level you're at, to, um, to find something to eat. And it's those strategies of getting information from text to do what you need to do, which I think is at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. so. And I think it just occurred to me that, um, that in terms of the contribution of the ELI to the, mm -hmm. to the book mm -hmm. and the, the issue of wh why is it that uh, in this era there's a textbook that is still being published after 40 years, still being used going into its sixth edition and so forth. Um, I think it has to do, uh, I think the whole uh, environment, the, the context of, of the ELI contributed directly to that. I mean, if you go through and look at the, uh, what we brought to the task in addition to our, uh, our teaching experience, um, Sandy's interest in uh, text linguistics and discourse analysis and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Barb Dobson uh, is an expert in testing and I was doing my dissertation uh, on reading and um, bilingual reading so that we had um, a convergence of expertise although we were all youthful experts and still wildly um, uh, hungry for external um, sources and information we were uh, we read voraciously we were preparing for uh, we were writing papers and preparing for comps and that sort of thing but it was all funneled into this experience and then the fact that um, readers choice became something of an event uh, something of a phenomenon in the school and uh, 
the uh, we were classroom testing it. Teachers were giving us feedback on it and so forth. And and then when it got to a certain point where we could, it was sort of ready for prime time. We were it was being used in in um, sections, uh, being taught by people who uh, were not the authors, which was a first step. And one day, uh, one of the teachers uh, came in and to the cubicles and said, I've just finished teaching X, Y, or Z unit and uh, was approached by a student afterward who told me that I wasn't doing it right, that I should do it this way, I should do it that way. And what had happened was, this was a student who had been in one of our classes and uh, was uh, familiar with the materials and the, the style, the rhythm, and so forth, that went beyond the, the text. I mean, it was how we did the stuff. And so she wanted to be coached on, uh, or she, she said, so what's the secret? How do I do this so that my students don't <laughs> correct me afterward? Which alerted us to the fact that the, the, uh, that the students were engaged in the material, that it, it did strike them as, as uh, different from other reading texts and so forth. I think we sensed this because part of the reason for, for uh, doing, uh, uh, working on the materials in the first place was we were unhappy with the uh, language and life in the USA. Uh, well, we don't <laughs> want to name any names. That, that was my former, uh, my first ESL graduate class was in that um. that person's classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I had no idea. Oh well. So anyway, the um, it was. I think the, uh, just I, I, it seems to be the whole environment. Looking back on it, perhaps this is uh, peeling away other important factors that, in fact, uh, should have been should be mentioned. But for me, looking at Reader's Choice, looking at what we accomplished as teachers and what uh, was going on, then that was a that was a major aspect of the experience. 